Um, shall we kick off, Jan? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And as with those comments, I bet lots of defendant lawyers have probably switched the webinar off now. But yeah, <laughs> sorry, I won't be commenting too much on um, the impact of Griffiths, but I'll leave that to Sarah's, ca in Sarah's capable hands. I mean, um, thank you, everybody, for joining. I can see that we've got, well, when I last checked, um, over 130 people, um, travel lawyers joining, which is fantastic. Um, I just wanted to start off by basically saying that it's important to note that Wood is still trite law at the current moment. Um, the obiter dicta in Wood still stands, um, but obviously um, Griffiths clarifies Wood. Um, and so we felt it, was, it would be necessary to do a recap. And obviously everybody loves the story, as, as Sarah's just said, um, before you all joined. Um, but by way of summary, um, the Wood case related to obviously Mr and Mrs Wood, who attended the Dominican Republic and stayed at the Grand Bahia for two weeks in April 2011 to celebrate their Ruby wedding anniversary. It was an all-inclusive holiday and during the course of that holiday they both developed quite nasty gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal illness and Mr Wood was actually hospitalised for a short period. And obviously they both alleged that their illnesses were caused by inadequate health and hygiene standards at the hotel, i.e. food or drink that they were served at the hotel restaurant caused them illness. Obviously Tui denied liability um, and essentially in the defence um, they said um, in quotation, it is admitted that there was an implied term in the contract between the claimant and the defendant that the services part of that contract will be carried out with reasonable skill and care and that any goods supplied under the contract are of satisfactory quality. Um, obviously, as you all know, this became inconsistent with how the case actually developed. Um, the defendant's counsel, um, as you know, went on to take a very different approach and he essentially said that Mr and Mrs Wood's um, package holiday for the supply of services um, was so that there was no implied term under section four of the sales of goods 1982 um, because there was no transfer of goods as per part one of that act and rather the contract was for the supply of services and as such the defendant's argument was that the relevant implied term was provided for by part two of the 1982 act which essentially states that the supplier will carry out the service with reasonable skill and care. Um, the defendant argued, as you know, that there was no contractual obligation that the food and drink supplied to the woods would be a satisfactory quality. And that's a key point that, that, that has carried this case along. Um, the first instance judge, H.H.J. Worcester, his honour Judge Worcester, did not agree, as you know. He found that the claimants had acquired their illness through eating food or drink in a beverage provided by the hotel, which was contaminated. And in his judgment, he essentially said, I find that there was an implied term in this contract that the food and drink consumed by the claimants at this hotel should be of satisfactory quality pursu uh, pursuant to the 1982 Act. And that term was breached. And so the defendant was liable on that basis. Um, Mr. Mr. Wood um, was awarded just under £18,000 to include loss of enjoyment, diminution in value, general damages and special damages and special damages um, and Mrs. Wood just under £9,000 and I should just point out as well because this is important as we go through this presentation that actually in the Wood case there was no microbiology report and no microbiologist called in, uh, to trial. Obviously, as you all know, um, the defendant did not accept this judgment and they promptly appealed it to the Court of Appeal. And the main ground of appeal that was carried through to the Court of Appeal, because um, a number of them were actually dropped before the hearing, was whether, well, the issue of whether the package holiday contract con contained the condition as to satisfactory quality implied by Section 4.2 of the 1982 Act. The appeal was heard on the 22nd of November 2016 before three Court of Appeal judges, um, Sir Brian Leveson, Justice McFarlane and Lord Justice Burnett. Um, as you're probably, you've probably all um, studied the Wood and Tui judgment very carefully and there's lots of archaic reference to um, transfer of property for the 1982 Act and whether that constitutes the transfer of property for the purpose of that Act. But essentially, I would say that the main point here was the defendant denied that Section 42 was engaged at all because they felt um, they were of the view that uh, because the package holiday was not a contract for the supply of goods, 
um, and that they denied property in the food ever passed to the claimants. And therefore, that, that section did not apply. Um, so essentially, the, the gist of the Wood Appeal um, was whether there was an implied condition that the goods supplied under that, under that contract were of satisfactory quality. Um, the Court of Appeal, as you know, held that such a term was implied into the contract and they, up, and they upheld, um, all three of them um, on majority, upheld the judgment of His Honour Judge Worcester. And um, I think paragraph 28 of that, that judgment helpfully summarises this as essentially contaminated food cannot be obviously of satisfactory quality. Um, obviously the claimants were delighted after being pulled through the washing machine of prolonged litigation for over six years, um, going through a number of hearings, um, but sadly, well, you know, it, whilst it was over for them, um, it's not over just yet because the Court of Appeal judges quite helpfully um, for defendants um, and clarified for claimants, I would say, um, with their dicta um, starting at paragraph 29. Uh, where Sir, Ber Sir Justice Burnett said uh, contamination must be proved it might be, and it might be difficult to prove that food or drink was not of satisfactory quality in this sense in the absence of evidence of others who had consumed the food being similarly affected, afflicted. Additionally, additionally, other potential causes of the illness would have to be considered such as the vomiting virus. Obviously the key phrase here are other potential causes which have obviously being part of much debate um, amongst the, all of us over the last few years. Next slide please, um, slide 12 um, Sarah. So paragraph 30, um, Burnett went on to say the application of high standards in a given establishment when capable of being demonstrated by evidence would inevitably lead to some caution before attributing illness to contaminated food in the absence of clear evidence to the contrary. Um, I mean, what I would say here, um, to me, my takeaway from this is disclosure is obviously key. Um, and my view is, and the view that I've made very clear um, in my work over the last few years, is there's, if there's no documents, then an inference can be, with, can be drawn from this and that adequate practices are not being followed, which have given rise to illness. So this is why um, documents are so important, why we have seen so much um, by way of you know, satellite litigation in relation, pre-action disclosure applications, specific disclosure applications, because unless there's disclosure, um, these cases, as far as I'm concerned, they can be won and lost on, on the disclosure point just in themselves. Um, so Brian Leveson, um, at paragraph 34 of the judgment, um, obviously had to make a few extra remarks to help us all out. Um, he said, it will always be difficult, indeed very difficult, to prove that an illness is a consequence of food or drink which, is not, which was not of satisfactory quality, unless there is cogent evidence that others have been similarly affected and, on, and alternative, and I, ex, and I really, really hone in on the word alternative explanations would have to be excluded. So what did this all result in? Um, and the key point was um, this resulted in the, the need for claimants to rule out alternative causes and um, and as a result of that defendants have really honed in within defences um, you know at trial the point about the fact that we, we need to rule out eating outside of hotel for example and using social media disclosure witness evidence expert evidence to really assist with that um, swimming in the sea for example swimming outside of the hotel in water parks these are all considerations that now have well it depends on how you pursued these cases before but i wouldn't say now uh, but just really clarified what you need to 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 win these cases um, but also it's been seen that defendants have themselves obviously relied on their own disclosure showing where there's high incidence of short bursts of illness which would potentially point towards a potential outbreak of viral illness and that's obviously where um, non-medical expert reports have come in very useful so, so that's wood. Um, and then going on to, to slide 14, please, Sarah, um, we arrive at um, the case of Griffiths versus Tui, um, another Owen Mitchell case, um, which has, has gone through a number of hearings over the last couple of years. Um, and as Sarah says, there are members of the defendant's legal team on, on the call right now. So um, 
I think it will be it won't be alien to them what happened but just for everybody else um, in summary our client Peter arrived at the Aqua Fantasy Aqua Park Hotel in Turkey in 2014 starting on sorry the 2nd of August 2014 for a two-week holiday with his wife and son both and not many people know this but both Peter and his wife fell ill with gastroenteritis two days into the holiday um, and actually his son also sadly injured himself in a swimming pool with a very nasty injury to his foot so in summary it was it was a holiday from hell for them um, Peter's case was um, Mrs Griffith's case was resolved before we issued proceedings um, and that was done quite quite promptly um, but Peter was hospitalized for three days in Turkey and he's continued to suffer particularly evasive symptoms to the present day so his case was a lot more complicated which is probably why the case went on longer than his wife's uh, but I can't I can't really comment other than that um, but Peter's symptoms started on day two and he actually felt as though he was getting a little bit better but the symptoms actually deteriorated about a week later um, but the complicating factor, and I think the reason why this case actually ended up being so complicated, was that Peter ate outside of the resort um, on the 7th of August um, at a restaurant at a local, um, local town. Um, and I know a lot of you um, would see that and think, oh gosh, how, how are we going to win this case? And, and believe you me, I, that did also put the fear in God through me too. Uh, but this is where the expert evidence of Professor Pennington comes in um, and supported the claim. And whilst, as, as you know, from the judgment of Martin Spencer, it was a very concise report, it came to the conclusion that the food and drink at the hotel and the balance of probabilities caused his illness. Um, and upon return to the UK, it was noted, obviously, that Peter was tested for a number of pathogens and he was actually positive for um, Chiardia. Um, both parties were given permission at the first CCMC to rely on reports from gastroenterologists and microbiologists and the claimant also had permission to call a local standards expert because at this point it wasn't clear um, what the cause of illness was. It could have been the swimming pool, hence why we, we called a local standards expert. Um, the claimant served its reports in time, um, obviously, um, but the defendant failed to obtain and disclose expert reports in time. The defendant's gastro um, was late um, and they sought relief from sanction, which was refused by the district judge. The defendant's microbiology report um, was also late, but then we later received confirmation from their solicitors, from the defendant's solicitors, that they did not wish to rely on a microbiology report. Um, as Sarah and I have discussed, I'm not clear why that was the case. Um, obviously, I don't deal with the defendant's strategy, um, but obviously, as the picture has become clearer, it's still, it's obviously now looks as though uh, they probably regret taking that action. Um, the defendant raised part 35 questions and those were promptly answered by Professor Pennington, but these replies and these questions did not actually take the defendant's case any further forward. Um, and the defendant did not seek to cross-examine Professor Pennington at first instance trial to seek to, to try to answer, to, sorry, and try to ask further questions of Professor Pennington a few days before trial. But unfortunately, by that time, Professor Pennington had suffered a heart attack and he was in hospital and was unable to answer them. Um, at slide 15, please, um, Sarah. First instance, it was the claimant's case, as, I, as I've said, that on the balance of probabilities, he acquired the infection from food or drink or drink served at the hotel. And per Wood and Tui, um, it was constructed quite simply by trial counsel for the claimant that if the claimant proves that he contracted the infection from the food he ate at the resort, then that would make out his case for a breach of contract, a breach of implied contractual term of satisfactory quality. He doesn't he didn't need to prove negligence and he didn't need to prove a breach of local Turkish standards in that expert report. Professor Pennington um, confirmed in his report upon consideration of all the salient documents, including the particulars of claim and the defence. And it was his view that the claimant contracted his illnesses. And I use the plural because it, like, it came to light that Professor Pennington thought that there may have been actually two illnesses starting on the 4th of August and then a later one but he ruled that out and said that it appeared to be one illness and in any event both of them would have been con con contracted from contaminated food or fluid consumed at the hotel. 
all of this was obviously consistent with the claimant's witness statement and consistent in cross-examination that there was poor hygiene in the food service areas at the hotel. Her Honour Judge Truman accepted the claimant's account of not eating, eating outside of the hotel before feel, falling ill on the 4th of August. But the story, as you know, did not end there. Um, at, section, um, at slide 16, please, Sarah, I, I set out essentially that Her Honour Judge Truman found against the claimant because she did not feel that Professor Pennington had gone far enough in his report to explicitly rule out other potential sources of infection as per Wood. Um, the trial judge referred to the dicta in Wood, which I've mentioned earlier on, and, accept, and she accepted the criticism raised by counsel for the defendant. Um, Her Honour Judge Truman said that Professor Pennington's report had jumped too quickly um, from setting out the background to find a conclusion without adequately and explicitly considering other potential causes. And so the claim was dismissed because the claimant had not proven his case in her view. Um, obviously, this was hugely disappointing um, for us um, as the claimant's legal team at first instance. And so um, we were particularly, um, you know, felt it was unfair that essentially the, the, the expert had been allowed to get to trial and, and then the defendant would sit back and pick holes in, in that report. Um, which we felt was very unfair. Um, so the hearing, um, so the case was appealed um, to the High Court. And, but before, before that happened, she did quite help, Her Honour Judge Truman did quite helpfully set out what she thought in respect of quantum to, to assist the appeal judge in case there was one, dot, dot, dot. Over to you, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, you leave us on a cliffhanger there, Jeff. It's actually really fascinating to hear a more in-depth description of what happened because when you read a judgment it's you get a snapshot of what the judge thinks is important at that moment but for us as practitioners learning what happened procedurally is almost more important for us than the legal decision because we want to know how to run things and I, I can speculate you can't speculate but I can speculate that Tui probably thought well Pennington's report is not that great it's very short it's not very detailed he doesn't set out his reasoning um, it's not worth, in a claim of relatively low value, getting our own microbiology reports, which can be a hostage fortune, when we can just pick holes in Pennington's report. So I don't know whether that was their strategy or not, but it would not be an unreasonable strategy, I think, because it's proportionate to value the claim. And, you know, it is for the claimant to, to prove their case. And if they've got a, an expert's report that you as a defendant don't think proves the case, I can see the sense in saying, well, why should we get our own microbiology report, get a joint statement which might shore up the claimant's reports? Why should we not just sit back to trial, wait and pick holes in what we think is an adequate report? So I can kind of understand the strategic thinking there, actually. But in any event, it obviously didn't work at first instance um, in the Griffiths case. Um, because the, the trial judge, well, it did work at first instance, but it didn't work on appeal um, because the appeal judge said you can't do that. So what happened on appeal? Uh, Martin Spencer, who's actually been really, really busy lately, he's just done a fundamental dishonesty case as well, um, which you may be interested in. I think we did it in the weekly roundup a couple of weeks ago, um, a case which sets out his views on fundamental dishonesty. And, and he's been quite He's been firm but fair in the last few weeks. I think Martin Spencer's um, obviously taken, he's obviously come back from holiday himself and he's taking a view that he wants to make some firm but fair decisions. So in that one, he was firm but fair on fundamental dishonesty. In this one, um, he's finally against the defendant. So he held um, on appeal in the Griffiths case where the expert report is uncontroverted. Um, there's no confounding expert opinion and the basis for it hasn't been shaken. It has to be accepted by the court. So the appeal succeeded, as did the claim. Now, actually, I have to say that Jat is being quite modest about how he and Owen Mitchell handled this appeal, because I've got to say, I myself would have thought that this was quite a risky undertaking to appeal um, the first instance decision of her on Judge Truman, um, because they had a report from Pennington, which was very short. And if you read the judgment of uh, Martin Spencer um, on appeal, he actually quotes the whole report, and it's only a few paragraphs long. So although that may be all that is needed to set out, you know, these are my instructions, these are the facts, this is causation, this is the chain of reasoning, he doesn't set out every link in the chain of reasoning. So if you read the judgment in Griffiths and Two, I think 
Truman's criticisms um, lifted from defendants counsel's criticism of, of Pennington are not actually unreasonable because Pennington doesn't go into the kind of depth that you sometimes see in microbiology reports. But Martin Spencer held that that was acceptable, that's enough in circumstances in which the expert report is uncontroverted. That's not to say unchallenged. And there's a difference between an uncontroverted report and an unchallenged report. Bear in mind in Griffiths and Chewy that Pennington's report was challenged by the defendant. It wasn't the case that the de defendant just accepted that report, the factual basis for it and the reasoning. They didn't. They didn't accept either the factual basis for it until after cross-examination and they never accepted that the reasoning or the conclusion in Pennington's report was right. So they challenged the report every step of the way, but what they were not able to do was to controvert it, i.e. to bring some evidence to stand against it in Martin Spencer's opinion. So because they weren't able to bring factual evidence to shake the factual underpinnings of the report, and because they had no expert evidence to challenge um, what Pennington had said in his report, Spencer held that it was an uncontroverted report. Now imagine the defendant may feel slightly hard done by with that because actually they did have witness evidence from um, the hotel employees. And not only that, but they had an audit which had been undertaken during the course of the holiday and which found, I think Jack will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was a hundred percent audit, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, so the hotel had scored a hundred percent on an audit undertaken during the holiday. Um, but that audit had never been put to Pennington. So Spencer said, well, okay, you've got some evidence that goes against this expert report, but it's not been put to Pennington, so he's not had a chance to comment on it. And the judge, so the judge held, it's the defendant's job to put that evidence to Pennington if they want to use it to challenge his report. And it seems to me actually that must be right because if you're going to say that an expert's wrong about something, you ought to give him an opportunity to say why he's not wrong about it and why actually the audit would or wouldn't have made any difference to him. So Martin Spencer says, it's not a case of an unchallenged report, but an uncontroverted report has to be accepted if it meets minimum standards. Because what the defendant was saying is that this is just a bare report. There's nothing there. There's no chain of reasoning. Um, but Martin Spencer says, well, actually, if you have complied with CPR Part 35, which Pennington had, um, and if you have set out, these are the factual matters, this is how I deal with causation, and this is my opinion, you don't have to put every link in between those uh, statements um, for the court to accept your evidence. So effectively, if a report complies with CPR part 35, and they all ought to, if a report complies with CPR part 35, and there is no challenging expert evidence, and the factual underpinnings of the report are not um, shaken in cross-examination, that report must be accepted by the court. And this is why I say that I think Griffiths is important outside the, the, the small confines of food poisoning or even travel cases because it's an important decision about how courts approach expert evidence as a whole. It's done within the context of food poisoning but there's no reason why that reasoning should not apply to local standards evidence, should not apply to um, foreign law evidence, should not apply to going outside our own area, clinical negligence evidence um, and so on and so forth. So he's looking at expert reports more generally, and he's saying, well, look, if it complies with CPR Part 35 and there's no other expert evidence, the expert's not been cross-examined and therefore um, his report's not been shaken, the court has to accept what the expert says. And that's why the, the, uh, the appeal succeeded, um, the claim succeeded, and the claimant now has recovered pending appeal. Interestingly, and I think this is uh, obiter, um, Martin Spencer accepted there is a distinction between quantitative claims and qualitative claims. Um, the one being uh, claims that rely on an outbreak of illness at the hotel. So, you know, we've all seen them, you know, a 3,000 person hotel at which two and a half thousand people are ill. 
Um, that's one type of food poisoning claim. Um, and in relation to uh, uh, the qualitative claims, that's a claim that relies on stool sampling and an expert report on causation. So there's a distinction between those two. And you will need an expert report in relation uh, to the latter, but not necessarily the former. So he's talking about the latter type of claim. Now, I've seen some commentary saying that that means that Griffiths is only relevant in those cases where there is a positive stool sample, as there was uh, in Griffiths, as Jack has said. And I can see you're shaking your head, Jack. Um, I actually think that's wrong, probably. Um, and the reason I think it's wrong um, is that Wood itself didn't involve a stool sample, don't forget. So Mr. and Mrs. Wood um, didn't have an identified pathogen, but they still succeeded um, at trial. And there's no mention of stool sampling as being determinative in Wood and Tui itself. And there's no mention of stool sampling as being determinative in Griffiths and Tui either. And it seems to me that the reasoning that uh, Martin Spencer deployed in Griffiths doesn't rest on stool sampling. It rests on what you do with expert evidence and the kind of um, weight that is to be given to an expert's report. So whatever is the content of that report is distinct from the weight to be given to such a report when it is uncontroverted. So I actually don't think stool sampling is either determinative or even actually on one reading of the judgment at all relevant in these cases now. So where you have a case where there's no identified pathogen, but you have an expert's report which supports causation and there is no expert evidence that goes against that opinion on causation, it seems to me that these cases are likely to succeed. So in order to, to um, defend those claims, um, whether there's an identified pathogen or not, I think defendants now will need to get expert evidence that goes against the claimant's expert evidence, because otherwise the decision in Griffiths and Tui leads to the inevitable conclusion that a trial judge has to follow the expert evidence. So what's the consequence of that? What are the implications for that? Well, why did the appeal succeed? Um, Martin Spencer says, well, it's because the defendant hasn't served controverting evidence. And he actually says in the course of his judgment, you know, Pennington's report's not great. And he accepts that. There are criticisms of the report. And maybe if the defendant had produced its own evidence controverting that report, and maybe if there'd been a joint discussion between experts, it might have been that Pennington might either have shored up his, his evidence, or he might have folded. He might have um, said, well, actually, yeah, you're quite right. Um, I have missed out some chains of, uh, chain of reasoning and incubation is not right or the symptoms are not right or, or whatever. But we can't speculate about that. What we've got is the report we've got and you are lumbered with it. So as I say, what are the implications here? Do we now apply for permission to rely on expert evidence in these cases? Well, claimants, of course, always should have had expert evidence on causation in these cases. And if you hadn't, there was a great big gap in your case. Um, defendants have been commonly defending these cases on the basis that um, the claimant's expert reports are not good enough. It seems to me that now you can't really do that because if um, the claimant has a microbiologist report, let's say, or even a GP report that gives some evidence on causation, and if it complies with CPR part 35, and if the factual underpinnings aren't challenged on cross-examination, if defendants don't have their own expert evidence to challenge the expert opinion on causation, following Griffiths and Chew, it's very hard to see how they can win these cases. So I think the result of this is probably inevitably that defendants now have to apply for permission to rely on their own expert evidence in all of these cases. And will the courts grant them permission to do so? Well, with fast track cases, the courts are very, very unwilling to do that because it's disproportionate to the value of the claim. But of course, if the defendant comes along and waves Griffiths and Tui at a trial judge and says, well, look, if you don't give me permission to get my own expert evidence, Griffiths and Tui means that I lose. It must be in the interest of justice for a defendant to get permission to have its own expert report, because otherwise it's an unlevel playing field. Is unlevel a word? I think it 
uneven, uneven, let's say, playing field. Um, because it means that the claimant has got their own evidence, defendant hasn't been allowed to get their own evidence, and therefore the defence has to fail if Griffiths and Tui is followed, as it must be because it's binding. So it seems to me that actually we are going to see a lot more applications from defendants to get their own expert evidence. And it seems to me that courts ought to be granting permission because not granting permission um, is unfair, actually. Um, so I think that's the implication. Um, so does the decision mean that in all claims where there's expert evidence from one expert and the factual basis for it is accepted, the expert's opinion must necessarily be accepted? So this is what I was saying previously. Is it of greater application? I think it is, actually. There's no reason why this reasoning um, should not be accepted in all cases, whether it's food poisoning, um, foreign standards, foreign law, um, medical negligence, professional negligence. It, so it's, it's actually a, a case of wider application. And I'm supported in that by the fact that there was discussion of the dis, uh, decision of the Court of Appeal in Kennedy and Cordia, um, because the counsel for the defendant was saying, well, look, in Kennedy and Cordia, they say that the court has to make its own determination of the expert evidence. The court's got to look at it with its own eyes, as opposed to just following the expert evidence. Well, Martin Spencer said about Kennedy and Cordia, well, that may well be so where expert evidence is controverted, because in Kennedy and Cordia, that was a case where there were rival warring expert reports. In Griffiths and Tui, there weren't. So there was nothing to go against what the expert said in terms of opinion, because counsel can't give evidence about an opinion. So who else would stand against the expert? So I think Griffiths does align with Kennedy and Cordia, although it is a little uncomfortable because Kennedy and Cordia is saying, well, the court needs to apply its own reasoning. Whereas in Griffiths and Tui, um, Martin Spencer is saying, well, look, you've got a report, it's uncontroverted, therefore you must follow it. You don't apply any um, reasoning to, to what you think is the conclusion of the report. So it is a little uncomfortable, but it does align. And it seems to me it's not actually inconsistent with Kennedy and Cordia. The question, of course, on everyone's lips is will to appeal? Um, if they do appeal, which parts do they challenge? Do they challenge the whole decision or do they challenge part of it? Do they challenge this decision that there's a qualitative quantitative um, distinction? Uh, it seems to me that that's over to dicta, so they can't just challenge that. If they're going to challenge that, they must also challenge um, this decision about accepting expert evidence. Um, will they challenge um, the, the accepting expert evidence part of things? There are people watching this webinar who know the answer to that, I suspect. I don't, um, and I suspect neither does Jats, and, and sort of 95% of, of people watching. Um, it's an interesting question. There are dangers involved with appealing this decision. Um, the, in a sense, and I, I don't want to labour this point too much for those, those watching from TUI, but they're damned if they do, damned if they don't, because if they don't appeal Griffiths and TUI, they're lumbered with this decision, which says that in all cases of this kind, you've got to get expert evidence, which controverts the claimant's expert evidence. So that's, that's not good because it means it's gonna be much more expensive to fight these cases. On the other hand, if they do appeal Griffiths and Tui, they might get um, a decision which rose back from it um, in respect of expert opinion. So it might say, well, you know, if you've got an expert report that clearly you think has missed out a couple of chains, a couple of links in the chain of reasoning, then you don't have to follow it. Well, so far so good. But it also gives the court an opportunity to clarify the Ota Dicta in Wood and Tui which has been very, very effective in defeating these claims. So, and, and actually it seems to me that quite a lot of trial judges at first instance have elevated that obiter dicta and wooden tui that Jack was talking about earlier and turned it into a kind of higher threshold in these food poisoning cases um, or higher evidential burden of proof. And if TUI appeal, there is a danger that the Court of Appeal is going to revisit that and say, well, actually you've misunderstood this all along. And that's just over to dicta. There's no higher evidential burden in cases of this nature. So there's very um, significant risks attached to either appealing or not appealing. Um, but I think I'm right in saying that they've got until the 20th, 21st of um, September to say whether they're going to appeal or not. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so we will find out within the next couple of weeks. But it's a very problematic decision now for uh, tour operators because um, Almost anything that happens now is, is 
not helpful for tour operators. Um, so they're, they're in an unenviable position. Um, and actually we had an illustration of that in a recent case, um, which Dominique was involved in actually. Uh, and as I say, another, a number of other um, participants in the webinar, Turpin and Tui, as I say, this was an appeal um, that was heard prior to Griffiths being handed down, but the judgment was then handed down after Griffiths was handed down. So the judgment in Turpin and Tui um, refers to Griffiths and Tui, um, refers to it, endorses it and follows it. And this is, um, it's not binding, it's a circuit judge decision, Her Honor Judge Walden Smith. Um, and it's a, it's a real classic case. It's, it's one of those ones where there are lots of these around. Uh, claimants relied on reports of, of Lindsay Thomas. The judge at first instance didn't like the reports. Um, relied on an audit score of 100 percent you see what i mean i mean these are the kind of facts that turn up again and again and again so the judge at first instance accepted the criticisms of dr lindsay thomas's report um and found uh, against the claimant um walden smith says in in uh, passing it's important the court doesn't elevate the dictum in wood and tui to being an inalienable test but rather acknowledge it provides sensible guidance as to what may, might be required to satisfy the evidential burden so already following griffiths we're seeing a judge who's saying look the wood and tui obiter that's that's not law that's not uh, an evidential threshold there's no different evidential threshold in these food poisoning cases it's just guidance on what they felt at the time on what they saw at the time bearing in mind as i say that in wood and tui there was no pathogen but the claimants succeeded so already we're seeing judges um i don't know whether she would have said that or not prior to griffith and tui perhaps she wouldn't um saying yeah we're rowing back from the application of that dicta she found the criticisms of the expert were unjustified and the failure of the judge at first instance to place reliance on the report ran counter to the decision in Griffiths and the appeal succeeded and so did the claim. So this is what I say when I mean two are, are, are faced with the difficulty and tour operators generally face with the difficulty that following Griffiths and Tui there will be cases out there in which either first instance judges would not have placed uh, reliance on the report or in the future would, would not but for Griffiths have placed reliance on the report but they will now they will now um, because they have to um, as a result of the reasoning uh, in Griffiths so I think we can expect to see quite a lot more of these both in relation to successful appeals and in relation to um, successful claims being brought in circumstances in which there's only one expert report and it's being adduced by the claimant and there are a lot of them out there. So it'd be interesting to see quite uh, what happens uh, in the future. Um, usefully in Turpin and Tui, uh, Walden Smith again held it's not appropriate to criticize an expert for failing to comment on a piece of evidence on which they've not been asked to comment. And again, this is another of my own back <laughs> bugbears um, that you often get in trial. Defense counsel stands up, rips a, a, a claimant's expert to shreds but actually the expert hasn't had a chance to answer those criticisms and that's not fair and I accept of course that it's for claimants to prove their case and that claimants ought to be bringing the evidence that's needed to prove their case but it's also the onus is also on defendants if they're going to criticize an expert and particularly criticize the expert's professionalism uh, or criticize them personally either for failing to um, provide a range of opinion um, or, or for failing their professional duties under CPR Part 35, those are serious matters and it's incumbent upon dependent defendants to put them to experts. And there are particular uh, counsel actually who produce defences routinely criticising experts personally and professionally because they have not provided a range of opinion, they have not commented on disclosure, they have not done this, they have not done that, they have not read medical records, that is inappropriate. Um, and it's particularly inappropriate for a trial judge to rely on those criticisms where they've not been put to the expert. And so I think both Griffiths and Turpin supports me, so it must be right, um, in, in thinking that it's not right to impugn an expert's professionalism without giving that expert an opportunity to respond to those criticisms. Now, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Let's have a look. Andrew Spencer, 
What if defendant had put its 100% audit to the expert and the expert had replied, this doesn't change my view in any way? Well, if that had happened, and it, it does happen, and as Walden Smith says, the 100% the audit is just a snapshot of what happened, A, on a particular day, B, where the hotel has probably been told that they're going to come or, or knows that they're there, and C, may or may not have um, accompanied the auditor with a member of staff, and Walden Smith has regard to all of those matters. Um, it's neither here nor there, actually. So I think if the defendant had put its 100% order to the expert and the expert had said it doesn't change my view in any way, that um, would have been enough. Um, and, the, and actually, I, I think you're right, Andrew, to raise this as a, a problem for defendants, that if they put their criticism to the expert, it gives the expert an opportunity to say, whatever it is that you're putting to me doesn't change my view in any way. Um, and we all know that that's what claim experts are likely to do in the way that experts generally speaking do because the more you ask them questions the more entrenched they become in their opinion um, and it again it's the golden rule that I was discussing a couple of weeks ago that if you don't have anything to be gained by asking a part 35 question don't ask it but Griffiths kind of means it puts you in a cleft stick because you have to ask those questions otherwise the court's not going to accept those criticisms so I think that's that's the answer to that Jack, feel free to jump in on these ones, because I think... Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, although I would say that it's, it's probably both sides where experts are frequently instructed they're unlikely to change their views. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, claimant hack jobs. I'm saying that people generally actually come to a decision about anything it might be. And the more you put evidence to them, the more it shores up their opinion. And I think that's kind of human nature more than anything. Uh, Nigel Craig says, if timetables have closed in fast track matters awaiting trial, surely it be unjust now to allow defendant to get reports and reset the timetable? Yeah, we're getting a lot of these questions, actually, um, a lot since um, the decision of Griffiths came out, of people saying, well, I've got a trial in two weeks' time. The defendant is now saying, A, do you, do you accept that A, the report is controverted, or B, we can get uh, permission to get our own expert evidence? The answer is, A, it's challenged but not controverted if you've got no evidence to put against it. So, no, I don't accept that it's controverted, but I do accept it's challenged. And B, make an application to get your own um, medical evidence. Because if a, trial's, if a matter's set out, down for trial, for example, um, you can't actually agree between yourselves as parties, even if you wanted to, to vacate the trial. So the defendant would have to make an application in any event to vacate the trial and get their own reports. They always have to do that because the court has a case management, management duty um, to limit reports to what's necessary. I actually have a lot of sympathy for those representing defendants in cases like that, where previously it's been thought that it was enough to sit back and criticize expert reports. And now following Griffiths and Chewy, it doesn't look as if that is enough. Um, but I suspect a lot of judges will say, well, that's a tactical decision you took for reasons of um, economics or tactical reasons or for whatever reason it was, if you take that gamble, this is always going to be the danger. Um, but if you don't get your own expert reports, that it could blow up in your face. And it, it, I suspect quite a lot of judges will take, take that decision and say, well, you gambled on not getting expert report. That's tough luck. And I, it sounds harsh, but I mean, I suspect the answer actually is, do the courts want to vacate trials? Some courts are perfectly happy to vacate trials at the moment, especially with COVID-19 and the backlog going on. Other courts will not vacate a trial under any circumstances whatsoever. And it just is going to depend on the court, what their list is like, which is a completely unsatisfactory answer, but I suspect is actually the right answer. Uh, Alec Hancock, re-putting evidence to other parties, part 35 experts, can they do that when part 35 questions of the report rather than cross-examination? Oh, that's an interesting question. The use of, of part 35 questions, because you're not allowed to use part 35 questions to cross-examine an expert. So can you put documents to them? I think if you're seeking clarification, you can put documents. Um, so can you clarify your reports or update your report in the light of this disclosure, which you did not have when you um, when you did the report. So the criticism is often made of um, claimants experts, well you haven't considered this documentation, to which the answer is the reason they've not considered that documentation is that it wasn't disclosed at the time 
that the report uh, was done. Um, there has to be, I think, a mechanism by which the expert can consider disclosure made uh, in, and indeed witness statements made after um, their report was concluded because that disclosure may change their mind. So I think if you're acting for defendants, you have to be quite careful how you put it. And I've seen, again, there are some very aggressive um, standard part 35 questions, which are very, um, as I say, very aggressive um, and confrontational. That is not a good tactic in part 35 questions because you put them for the courts. Um, if you're acting for a claimant, you say, well, it, stand up and say that in courts. You know, you wouldn't be allowed to badger the expert that way in court. You shouldn't be allowed to do it in part 35 questions either. So as, it depends how you phrase it. If, if um, acting for a defendant, you say, you know, when you did your report, you didn't have this disclosure. Here are five Lever Arch files of documents of temperature checks, whatever it is. You know, could you update and clarify your report in the light of this stuff? Um, fine. Um, if you're going to say, you haven't dis discussed this, you've got it all wrong, you haven't said a range of opinion, then you're going to be in trouble with that. So it, it's, you know, as with everything, it depends how you do it, which is not terribly helpful, but I think there must be a mechanism for allowing it. Okay. Um, just before you go on to the next one, I think Alec also emailed us some questions before the webinar but I think we've now covered them um, Sarah so Alec asked do you agree that courts should now be allowing claimants to obtain non-expert evidence in addition to medical expert reports where a pathogen has been identified as a matter of course I think we've dealt with that yeah I mean I think the the battle round in these cases has always been causation so in a sense the gastroenterology falls away and especially in fast track cases is it proportionate to get a gastroenterologist and a microbiologist? Probably not. If you have to choose one or the other, probably the microbiologist because they're talking about causation, which is actually the issue here. Because the claimant, don't forget, they can give evidence themselves about how ill they were, what their symptoms were and how long it lasted. You know, they're not going to be able to give evidence about ongoing IBS or something like that. But if it's a relatively short period, fine, you can accept that. But what the claimant can't do is give evidence as to causation. Um, because they're not qualified to do that. It's not a matter of fact, it's a matter of opinion. So I think, um, yes, but what, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. You know, I think now it's going to be more important to get microbiology than it is to get gastroenterology or evidence of causation. You know, if you can get an expert who's good and give, give evidence on both, fine. Um, but the causation aspect is more important, I think. Yeah, and the other part of Alex's question was, do you think two we will trial and appeal to um, the distinction between quantitative and qualitative? So I think we all just probably need to wait. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, predicting things is a mug's game. Um, I think, uh, I don't know whether they'll try and appeal it or not. I don't think they can appeal it freestanding because that's not the basis on which the decision in Griffiths and Tui is made. So... Griffiths and Tui is all about expert evidence. It's not as much about this qualitative quantitative distinction. So they can't just appeal that aspect, it seems to me, of the judgment. If they're going to appeal the other aspect of the judgment, they might as well appeal that as well and try and knock it out as well. But they can't appeal that. So that's, that's going to stay with us unless Tui appeals the whole lot, I think. So, Sean Morgan, do you think defendants' position improves if they get leave to call claimants experts to give oral evidence at trial? Um, yeah, it does improve, if, uh, but only if they make headway. So, the, the difficulty for the defendant in Griffiths and Tui was that there was just Pennington's reports and no oral evidence at trial. If you're in that situation, so if you find yourself towards the end of... Um, let's say at um, allocation, uh, not allocation questionnaire, pre-trial questionnaire stage, and you've not got your own expert evidence acting for a defendant, the only thing left to you now is either to make an application to get your own expert evidence in, or to make an application to cross-examine the claimant's expert, because otherwise you're gonna lose because you haven't controverted the reports, or, or do both in the alternative. So the court might say, well, I'm not vacating the trial to enable you to get your own uh, evidence and that's disproportionate. But what I will do is I'll give you permission to cross-examine the experts. 
The problem with that is the same problem that you've got with um, part 35 questions, which is that the claimant's expert is likely to double down um, on cross-examination. And even if you as counsel know that what they're saying may not be your experience in other trials, for example, you can't, you can't controvert it because we can't give evidence about that. The only person in court who is able to give evidence about causation will be the expert who is being cross-examined. And if the expert holds up under cross-examination, doesn't fall apart, um, then you're gonna be in difficulties. I don't know if everyone can see my cat, which is now joining me. Um, so uh, I think the difficulty with that is one way of dealing with it, but it's not gonna be, it's only gonna work if the claimant's expert is no good. If the claimant's expert holds up under cross-examination, it's just gonna make matters worse. But it is the only thing left to you if you can't get questions. Uh, Craig Bibby, as an alternative to the defendant not being allowed permission, can defendants seek permission for the claimant's expert to attend the trial? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, that is the same question, but put in a slightly different way. Um, yeah, I think they can seek uh, permission for the expert to be cross-examined. How much good that's going to do defendants, though, I'm not sure. They need to be quite careful about that because, again, it's quite unlikely that the claimant's expert is going to break down a cross-examination and say, oh my God, I've made a terrible mistake. Um, I'm completely wrong about the incubation period or whatever it might be. Um, the expert is likely to stick to their guns, you know, unless you know that you're looking at an expert who's a bit wobbly sometimes. Um, they are of variable quality. Let's see, any other questions? Uh, and I guess the other point about um, calling um, experts to trial in the fast track is how likely it is that you'll be able to conclude the hearing in one day. Um, I think, you know, more and more experts you start calling, um, the less likely it is that you will and it won't be able to stay in the fast track. So that's another consideration whether the more experts you call it would need to be moved into the multi-track. Um, and yeah. I assume that where we are now making applications to call experts that people are that practitioners will need to start considering track as well. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and I think where you've got a case where you've got one, maybe two expert, uh, one, one or two lay witnesses for the claimant, and you've got one or two experts for the uh, witnesses rather for the defendant, particularly if they're by video link or if there's an interpreter involved, you're not going to get that done in a day if you exactly. if you're cross examining an expert. Um, because you've got submissions and judgment as well and costs. So there are knock-on effects for Griffiths and Chewy, which may be problematic in terms of case management. Now, James Rutledge, why are you raising a hand or are you doing it by accident? <laughs> Darius, oh no, it's my nemesis. Yeah, we've got, I think, unless, I think there's a couple of COVID questions, Darius's, and then also the other one that we had earlier today that you were, you were going to deal with at the end. But unless, I think we can move on from Griffiths unless there's any other questions. I think, well, contrary to my specific instructions prior to the webinar, Ian Stebbings, I'm going to name and shame you, Ian, is asking a question on chat. People just oh. don't listen to me, Jack. So, uh, the fundamental dishonesty case by Spence. Oh, yeah, he's reminding me of, of the name of the um, fundamental dishonesty case by Martin Spencer, which is Peg and Webb. Thank you, Ian. I forgot, obviously. Um, and saying, could it be said the defence should have asked more robust Part 35 questions to highlight the lack of links? Um, I haven't seen, Jack will be able to answer that because I haven't seen the part 35 questions the defence um, asked about that. But I expect they did ask about the lack of links between the reasoning, did they? Um, I think they could have been more robust. Um, I think they did look as though they were um, quite standard questions, um, which is why I think they, as, as we got close to trial, further questions were asked, um, which were a lot more punchier. But as I said, we couldn't get them answered because Pennington was out of action. Yeah, and that's just something that's nobody's fault, really. Yeah. Um, okay, so James has asked, not a travel claim, but wouldn't, wouldn't, would Wood and Tui apply to a case where uncooked food was purchased? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, it's still uh, goods of satisfactory quality, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Any more questions on Griffiths, failing which we will move on to unrelated matters 
like to credit the legal team because it wasn't just me that worked on this case and I don't want to take all of the credit. So um, counsel Stephen Cottrell and leading counsel Rob Weir, who were absolutely fantastic. Rob's a class act. Yeah. And obviously Misky, who um, from Irving Mitchell were all part of the legal team and all fantastic. So it wasn't just me that worked on this. So although I do seem to be taking all the credit at the moment. <laughs> Well, Jack, don't make your Oscar speech yet, because if Tui appear and if they're successful, then, you know, you'll be playing the blame game after that. So True, um, true. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to unrelated topics. So um, all those who just uh, tuned in for expert evidence or for food poisoning cases and Griffiths and Tui, then please feel free to leave. There are no more holiday snaps to be seen. So... Um, really that's that oh and next week Emma will kill me if I don't say this next week it's Nick Yell and Lisa Doby on consent and material contribution in the clinical context I think they're talking about clinical negligence there so that's next week's um, webinar and the week after that I think I'm right in saying we've we started a two-part series on Montreal and the Athens convention which will prompt no doubt lots of difficult questions from Darius who as I say is my nemesis um, but quite interesting. And the important thing to remember about those two, Montreal and Athens, before you go, two-year limitation period. I know I've got a thing about it, but it is important. Right, now, let's move on to other matters. So, Darius, you mentioned in one of the previous webinars, you need to distinguish between time limits which are procedural and those that are substantive. How do you determine it? Uh, okay, so that's the first question from Darius, which is a a typically difficult question um, from him. I know he doesn't do it deliberately, but I think he thinks too much. Um, the answer to that is that all in relation to anything that has a foreign element to it that is being brought within the English courts, you've got to be very careful when looking at the foreign elements to determine whether you're looking at something procedural or substantive because procedural rules are always dealt with under the rules of the um, jurisdiction of the courts where you bring the claim. So if you're bringing a claim within England and Wales, the procedural rules will be the civil procedure rules um, of England and Wales. So that's what applies and that includes costs. And this is something that notwithstanding the fact that we've been doing these cases for about hundred years now, it's something that foreign insurers find very, very hard to accept because cost rules in Europe are typically um, more favourable to defendants and more favourable to insurers. And they find it very, very hard to get their heads around the fact that when you're in the courts of England and Wales, you follow our rules on costs. So the whole part 36 structure um, and part 36 consequences, for example, will follow any claim that's being made within the courts of England and Wales. But you may be applying a foreign law um, and it would have been the uh, foreign road traffic accident webinar um, where we drew the distinction of saying if you have a road accident in France, the English courts are going to apply French law to consideration of liability, limitation, uh, valuation of the claim. Um, however, the time limits within which you need to bring proceedings, uh, or while it serve proceedings, um, and do things in, in accordance with directions and procedural rules are going to be English time limits because that is to do with procedure. But the underlying limitation period, the substantive legal limitation period is going to be governed by the foreign law. So you determine that by asking yourself, what is substantive, what is procedural? Anything that's going to come within the uh, civil procedure rules is going to be procedural because those are the rules that govern how we litigate. Anything that governs um, the time within which a claim can be made is going to be substantive. So that's going to be whatever the foreign applicable law is. You get to um, certain areas which are quite difficult. I did something the other day about um, provisional damages and whether that's procedural or substantive. And actually that then becomes a very much more difficult issue. Can you get um, two bites of the cherry effectively? So in the English courts, you can get provisional damages where you get an award and then you get um, an order that you can come back if something goes badly wrong with the injury later and get something else. Um, but you can only come back under very particular circumstances within the English rules and those are rules of procedure. Um, whereas in some foreign law jurisdictions, you can, for example, I think in Spain, you can get an award now, but leave it open. The case just stays open that if you then um, 
incur future treatment costs, for example, you can then come back to the court. We can't do that within this jurisdiction. So the, it, the question of whether or not you can do that in any particular case is going to be um, something that's quite difficult to determine. And the, the higher courts have determined a number of these issues, these procedures is it substantive. So for example, incurring interest multipliers, uh, don't think they've done um, provisional damages yet, but you need to take it on a case by case. But when you're looking at the time bar within which a claim has to be brought, it will always be substantive law because of the Foreign Applicable Limitations Act. Foreign Applicable Limitation Periods Act, um, which, and that's what it says, I think it's 1984 Act. Uh, COVID question from Darius. In view of COVID, is distinguishing between bacterial and viral infections less important now in the sense that procedures at an establishment must be high, whatever? Um, there are different, um, there's a different legal analysis depending on whether it's bacterial or viral, because if you provide, well, no, that's not right. There's a different legal analysis depending on whether the person has acquired the infection by eating food or acquired the infection from another person or people within the hotel. Um, there is increasing evidence that you can acquire some infections, some pathogens through eating food. So it's not a distinction between bacterial and viral, it's a distinction between um, was it food? Was it consuming food that did it? Or was it something you caught by respiration from other guests or, or a member of staff in the hotel? If it's food that did it, it's kind of strict liability because if you provide food that contains a pathogen, it is by definition not satisfactory. And that's wooden tui. Um, if, however, you've caught it from another person within the hotel, whether it's a member of staff or a guest, um, that's something which, in which you have to prove negligence because it's not the supply of goods that has caused um, the illness. So I think that's the distinction as opposed to bacterial or viral. It's a distinction between is it food or is it not food? If it's not food, so for example, if it's COVID, then the claimant is going to need to prove negligence or faults on the part um, of the hotel or whatever establishment it, it may be. Also bear in mind, Darius, that when you're looking at something that happened on board ship, you're always looking at faults because you're always going to be governed, apart from in very particular circumstances, by the Athens Convention. So the claimant in Athens Convention cases always has to show faults. So the wooden two analysis doesn't apply in Athens Convention cases. So in Athens cases, um, procedures must be high, whatever, and that's and that. So as far as an Athens Convention case is concerned, um, it's always going to be negligence. Um, and actually, in Athens cases now with COVID because there is now this internationally recognized um, procedure in relation to cruise ships, if you follow that, you should be okay, as long as you implement that procedure. Now, yes, I did say that I would answer Tony Boswell's question, uh, which is about the German COVID case, which we talked about in the weekly roundup this week. So the Frankfurt case is only first instance case, and it's not binding, it's not even persuasive, but it may be of interest to English courts in relation to refunds for COVID-19. For those who don't get the weekly roundup, first, allow me to encourage you to sign up. It will improve your Mondays no end. Um, but mm -hmm. secondly, this is a case that we reported on uh, this week, which we think is the first COVID-19 refund case to be heard in Europe. Um, and um, this is heard underneath the German I think it's the civil code, which um, is their um, equivalent of our 2018 regulations. And this was in relation to a chap who had booked a package holiday in Naples. And actually these cases, there, there is coincidence here because I was actually on the island where he was planning to go a month after he was planning to go there. But anyway, be that as it may. So he booked a package holiday uh, with a German agent or German tour operator um, and was due to go out to an island near Naples because of Ischia, um, good choice, um, in sort of mid-April time. In March, he got cold feet about it. So March the 4th, I think it was, where he told the tour operator that he didn't want to go because of the incidence of COVID um, in that area. Now that was before the German foreign ministry started advising against travel. So he canceled his holiday, but the agent charged him for the usual cancellation fee, because of course you're always entitled to cancel a holiday under the terms and conditions, but you may have to pay a fee. So the agent charged him the usual cancellation fee because they said, well, look, 
the German Foreign Ministry hasn't advised against travel yet, so you can still go. This cancellation is unnecessary. There's still a possibility the package can, uh, can take place. He sued the, uh, the operator for uh, a refund of the cancellation fee, saying that at the time he cancelled, there were extraordinary um, circumstances in the place of departure, which meant that the holiday had to be cancelled. And in the weekly roundup, we discussed that um, decision and the fact that the German court um, said, yes, that's right. Um, whether or not their equivalent of the FCO has advised against travel at the time of cancellation, you look at the situation at the time of cancellation and you ask yourself whether at that time there was a, a reasonable expectation of that holiday being able to take place. And not just a reasonable expectation, but it has to be likely to take place. Now, in England, we have a flicker of hope test. Um, and we know that from the SARS epidemic, where we had a couple of cases called Lambert and Travelsphere um, and Clark, Clark and Travelsphere. Um, two cases which um, decide that where there is a flicker of hope of the holiday still taking place, A, the holiday maker is not entitled to cancel because there's still a possibility of the holiday taking place. And B, um, the tour operator can hold off cancelling because there's still a possibility of the package taking place because there's no extraordinary circumstances at that time, even if the holiday is then subsequently cancelled. And what happened in those cases was that the consumers cancelled the holiday thinking that they wouldn't be able to go to China during the course of the SARS epidemic, but they cancelled too early. At the time they cancelled, it looked as if it might be possible, it, it could be possible for the holiday to take place. In fact, the holidays then did not take place um, and other holidays, other similar holidays for that period were then cancelled by the tour operator. But notwithstanding that, they still didn't get their refund because they had jumped the gun. They had cancelled too soon. Um, and we've discussed this in a number of briefings. Um, and I think the, the German case is interesting because it says, well, look, you're not tied to the FCO advice. And this is an argument that's currently being made by On the Beach and Love Holidays, I think, with APTA, that actually they're not they're not bound by the FCO guidance. So whether the FCO is saying it can take place or it can't take place, you look at the evidence at the place of destination and you ask yourself whether or not there's still a flicker of hope of the holiday taking place. And of course, that's actually really difficult for us within this jurisdiction at the moment because um, the FCO guidance is so uh, changeable. Um, and what's very difficult for consumers, I think at the moment, is that there are circumstances in which a holiday can take place, but when you come back, you've got to quarantine. That doesn't entitle you to a refund because the extraordinary and unforeseen circumstances have to be taking place at the place of destination. They can't be taking place at the place of departure. So they're not entitled to a refund if they don't want to go on holiday because they're gonna to have to quarantine afterwards, which puts consumers in a difficult position but all it means is that they cancel their holiday and they pay the cancellation fee and that's what they're entitled to right let me have a look and see the next question an athens case why is it that section 9 cra 2015 implied terms are cancelled out by the, by the athens convention it is it trumped by the athens convention um, the answer to that is yes, it is trumped by the Athens Convention. The Athens Convention, don't forget, is an exclusive regime. So you can't bring a claim which would otherwise be covered by the Athens Convention outside the Athens Convention. You can't bring it in tort, you can't bring it in contract, you can't bring it in any other way other than under the Athens Convention. So it trumps everything. It trumps uh, the Consumer Rights Act, it trumps the common law duty of care, it trumps the standard terms and conditions, it trumps any representations that might have been made. You cannot bring a claim which is covered by Athens, so it takes uh, the accident or whatever it is, the incident takes place either when you're on board or in the course of embarkation or disembarkation. You cannot do that. Um, except under Athens. So the, the wooden two will not apply to an Athens case. Right, any other questions? Let me just... Jack's had to go, he said to me, because he's got a hearing. Well, to be fair, we have overrun by half an hour. Uh, so, well, if there are no other questions, I will 
uh, wish you all a good day. Thank you for hanging on for so long. Um, I'm sorry to go on for so long, but we did tack on a COVID webinar in the end, so you get a double bill today. Um, thanks, guys. As I say, next week, Nikki and Lisa Doby will be talking about uh, consent and material contribution. Um, it's a clinical negligence um, sort of background here, but the, the issues of material contribution are can be quite relevant to all of us because, of course, it's a general uh, injury um, issue. And actually, I find material contribution quite difficult. So consent, not so much for travel lawyers, but certainly the material contribution part worth tuning in for, I think. Um, as I've said before, but I'm shameless in, in self-publicizing, the week after that, we'll be starting the Montreal and Athens uh, two webinars. Effectively, they're not in the Back to Basics series, but we'll be talking about, um, I will be talking about limitation and nothing else, and other people will be talking about all the other stuff um, that we have under Athens, exclusivity, uh, bodily injury under Montreal, um, and stuff of that nature, nature, the more recent case law, and so on and so forth. So I hope to see you then. Um, thank you guys for coming, and I will see you next week.